Amagari Shulgex, Tatanix Newsom, Sarah Newcom, Diwayu, Timtianu, Lakskik, Deep Diku. Good afternoon to you all. I am Sarah Newcomb. I am Simtian. I am of the Eagle Clan. My tribe is a First Nations tribe uh, that is a Northwest Coastal tribe that resides in Metlakatla, Alaska. Uh, to kind of understand my positionality, I was born and raised in the church. I identified as Lamanite until 38 years of age. I was like 2016, so that's my age a little bit there. and. Uh, at that point, my spiritual path took a different direction, and I no longer identify as Lamanite. Even with that said, I respect those who choose to identify as Lamanite, those who are active that don't identify as Lamanite. Uh, this is just where I come from. So I'm not an active member of the church anymore, and I do not identify as Lamanite. No one needs to feel the same way as I do about things. I think many voices, many experiences are a good thing so that we can hear our different perspectives. With the change of my personal Lamanite identity, I began to research. Many years of research of <coughs> why we identify some tribes and not specifically as, as Lamanite. There's many mentioned specifically through the Doctrine and Covenants with the Lamanite missions. The Christopher Columbus theology is still current and in lesson manuals, which identifies the Taino people as Lamanite. And I, I started researching mostly historical documents from BYU professors, but also church manuals, conference talks, anything and everything I could get my hands on to understand Lamanite identity and kind of understand my experience as I stopped identifying as Lamanite, but continued to have family that did identify. So I began a blog, which I shared some of my research and also my personal journey and my personal reactions as I explored all those topics. Uh, and sometimes it was hard. Sometimes um, I was shocked by what I would learn. And during my research, I came across the history of aggression and displacement of the tribes in Utah and the surrounding areas of what tribes faced as Mormons came into the area. And it was like I had been just running along and hit a wall, like as hard as I could. I was shocked by what I didn't know as an indigenous woman who was born and raised in the church and had no idea about the history of interactions between the peoples. Now, my people being in Alaska didn't experience the things that people in Utah and surrounding areas did. As a Tsimtian woman, uh, descended of the Eagle Clan, I share this presentation as an act of decolonizing, as I will not participate in silencing another tribe's history, and we are many tribes and I stand with them. I think by just simply sharing history that that is an act of decolonizing. In all the recent years of learning, learning this history, one story stood apart from all of them, so much so that it has stayed with me constantly. It, it changed me and made me aware of why we need to remember history and also how much history we don't know that needs, needs to be shared. Before I move forward, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that history is sometimes extremely painful to learn. Uh, I don't want listeners in person or listening in on Zoom to be caught off guard because this is difficult history that I'm gonna share. So just be aware of your own needs. Do not be afraid to you know, have self-care and process what I'm sharing because it's not, it's not easy history. So it's at noon, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen, even when it is difficult. I had to push down arrow and it would change. Technical difficulties. There we go. Oh, there we go. Second up was an indigenous child who was born of the Tippinokas people in Utah. She was taken at approximately age five 
and raised by a Mormon family. She was renamed Renetta Sweet Murdoch by the Mormon family, and I will refer to her going forward as such, as that is the name that she came to be known by. Though much of what I know of Second Up is heartbreaking, uh, Renetta, Renetta lived a life of courage, strength, and of kindness towards all those who knew her. In 1845, Fernetta was born. In 1847, Heber C. Kimball declared, the Indians do not own the land in the first place. The land belonged to our Father in heaven, and we calculate to plow and plant it. And no man shall have power to sell his inheritance, for he cannot remove it. It belongs to the Lord. In 1849, Brigham Young assigned 30 families, <coughs> 150 people in total, to settle the territory where Pernetta lived with her people. A few months after Brigham Young sent the settlers, he said, the old Indians will not enter into the new and everlasting covenant or gain knowledge, but they will die and be damned. It is important to remember that in both peaceful interactions and in those with conflict, religious beliefs about Native Americans had a significant impact on every interaction. Religious beliefs that encompass the doctrine of discovery, settler colonialism, and layer a dichotomy between good Lamanites and bad Lamanites, or good indigenous people and bad indigenous people. The unique belief that the Book of Mormon, the cornerstone of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, claims to be indigenous history is well documented throughout the church's history including but not limited to missionary pamphlets, videos, etc., and continues to be included in current missionary work and lesson manuals. When calling indigenous peoples of the Americas Lamanites and telling a story of how they came to be a fallen people in need of redemption, is it any wonder that this set a path for troubling interactions between indigenous people and Mormon settlers? In January of 1850, there seemed to be a tipping point, a singular event that tipped the struggling relations. Old Bishop, an elderly indigenous man, was killed by three of the Mormon settlers for stealing a shirt from a clothesline. Their names were Rufus Stoddard, Richard Ivey, and Jerome Zabriskie. They shot Old Bishop, cut his stomach open, filled it with rocks, and dumped him into the Provo River. When they returned to their settlement, they bragged about it. Old Bishop went to find him, and they were angry when they saw what had been done to him. They wanted the murderers punished, but the Mormons refused to punish those who had killed Old Bishop. The indigenous people planned to respond in force. One of the Mormon settlers, Peter W. Conover, traveled to Salt Lake City to request reinforcement from the Deseret Militia. On January 31st, 1850, Higby, oh, Isaac Higby, had also traveled to Salt Lake City and petitioned Brigham Young. Brigham Young held a meeting with his counselors, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and the militia commander, Daniel H. Wells. During this meeting, Apostle, P, Apostle Harley P. Pratt stated, it best to kill the Indians. Isaac Higby responded, every man and boy held up their hand to kill them off. Willard Richards added, my voice is for war and exterminate them. Brigham Young proceeded to order an extermination campaign against the indigenous peoples. Young ordered that all the men were to be killed, women and children to be saved if they behave themselves. Military orders were drafted immediately. On February 7th, 1850, the Mormon militia left Salt Lake. The following day on February 8th, the campaign was carried out with zeal, a voluntary force made up of militia from Salt Lake City and Utah Valley, supported by cannon, surrounded and laid siege to a group of about 70 Indians under Big Elk. Unit commanders of the militia were instructed to take no prisoners and let none escape but do the work up clean. One record states, while Big Elk was being pursued toward the mountains, a second militia company dispatched them, dispatched from Fort Utah and marched south. 
Here wrote one historian, the violence shifted from warfare to killing. After disarming a large band near the southern edge of Utah Lake, the militiamen shot them down in cold blood. But it was the brutal and senseless act that followed the slaughter that is the most chilling. According to multiple historical sources, they were gunned down at Table Point and they were beheaded with their skulls taken as trophies. One eyewitness witnessed Big Elk's head hanging up in Fort Utah, hung pendant by its long hair from the willows of the roof of one of the houses. As for those massacred at Table Point, both Abner Blackburn and Anna Clark Hale substantiated the fact that the Indians' bodies had been mutilated and their heads brought back to Fort Utah. I can never forget, Hale remembered, the horrible and frightening scene when the boys brought into the fort a number of Indian heads. It was awful. On February 10th, 1850, Brigham Young said, I am sent now to confiscate all their property and then put them in the heat of battle and kill them. On February 13th, <coughs> General Daniel H. Wells wrote to Brigham Young that 15 or 20 warriors with their families had surrendered to the militia led by Captain Grant by the lake shore of Table Mountain. The following morning, Wells wrote, pleased to make some suggestion in relation to the disposal of some 15 or 20 squaws and children. Records of the Tippinogus massacre state that the Mormon militia approached the Tippinogus, telling them that they were friendly. The militia proceeded to line them up and execute them. Dozens of Tippinogus women and children were enslaved. Many of the prisoners were placed in Mormon families to be servants. This was done to keep the survivors from their, quote, savage pursuits and bringing them up in the habits of civilized and Christian life, close quote. Most survivors died or escaped. Fernetta was very young at this time, around five years of age, when her people were attacked by the Mormon militia at one of Wakara's camps. She and another child, a boy named Sub Pickets, were put into the back of a wagon. Sub Pickets, not much older than Pernetta, had been pulled off the <clears> remains <throat> of his mother and placed in the wagon with Pernetta. Orrin Porter Rockwell sold Pernetta and Sub Pickets to Joseph Stacy Murdoch, who paid two oxen for them. Sub Pickets was renamed Albert Sub Pickets Murdoch. In a legal hearing, Albert Sapickets Murdoch is recorded giving the following testimony, that when he was a young child, he remembers a fight between the whites and a band of Indians with which his parents were members, that after the flight, he remembers seeing his mother bleeding and that he remembers being in a covered wagon with a number of other Indian children. Two years later, at a similar hearing, a native man by the name, to, name of Juan Rhodes spoke up on behalf of the Murdoch children. He recounted that Pernetta's parents were captured in a fight with the whites near Provo Canyon. In the Murdoch family journal, it states that Joseph feared what would happen to the children if he did not take them. Joseph Murdoch gave the children to his first wife, Eunice. Eunice gave second up the name Pernetta, which had been Eunice's grandmother's name. Joseph wrote in his journal, the boy was just shedding his baby teeth and the girl was about a younger, year younger still. Eunice loved the children as her own. The Murdoch family journals convey a lot of kindness and love that they had towards the children and what the children experienced in the Murdoch home, especially from Eunice, who was very loving to both children. One journal states that during her childhood, Fernetta was taught to read and write by her mother Eunice, right along with Albert Sub Pickett's and the many and many of Joseph Murdoch's other children by his other three wives. The journal also states that later Fernetta had grown into a beautiful young woman, well educated and refined. A young Indian man became attracted to her, and both Eunice and Joseph were concerned that she might be lured away from both family and from the church. So Joseph went to his friend, Brigham Young, and asked him for some counsel and guidance. Brigham Young listened closely, and then, to Joseph's shock and dismay, he advised Joseph Murdoch to marry Fernetta. 
Brigham Young said that the marriage would also promote an even closer bond between Joseph and the Lamanite brothers. On June 26, 1859, Joseph, Murdoch, and Pernetta were married in the endowment house by Brigham Young. Pernetta was one of the first Lamanites to enter into the temple in this dispensation, according to a history seen and read by Luann Murdoch. When Pernetta was married, her adopted father became, she became his fourth and youngest wife. She was 13 or 14 years of age at the time of the marriage. In a sketch of Aunt Pernetta, it also mentions how Pernetta helped her people. It states the following, Pernetta, wife of Joseph S. Murdoch, was held in great esteem and was a favored member of her tribe. Many meetings took place at Pernetta Murdoch's home. It was made a rest haven for many tired Indians and their stock. Pernetta remained a favored member of her tribe until her death. Pernetta was in a position to help her people as they experienced continuous trauma, loss of lands and lives, and forced relocation. Bernetta went on to have five children. She worked alongside her Mormon family as they faced failing crops and near starvation at times. In December of 1870, a message came from Brigham Young advising them to abandon the mission quickly as possible. As they were leaving, the children sang a song of sego roots and glue soup. We've had enough to eat. We'd like to change our diet to buckwheat cakes and meat. The family moved to Heber City hoping for a better life and more prosperity uh, for their children as they had been struggling for so long. In Heber City, from Pernetta settled into life, providing for and raising her children. Pernetta and many of the women would gather hops along the river. They would take their sacks and little lunch and be off really early. They would gather hops until their sacks were full then walk home. They would spread the hops on clean sheets on the upstairs floor to dry. When they were dry, they would take them to Mark Jeff's store and he would send them to Salt Lake to the brewery to put in the beer. They earned extra money from the sales of the hops. They saved scraps of cloth that were too small and not fit for quilts, rugs, and carpets and sold them making paper bags. They were thrifty women and earned extra money by washing and cleaning or helping others. Pernetta Sweet Murdoch died at the age of approximately 39 in Heber City on November 18, 1884. Joseph Murdoch's second wife, Eliza, raised Pernetta's living children and cared for them as if they were her own. Pernetta was greatly loved by her Mormon family and was a favorite of all the children. To the memory of Pernetta Sweet Murdoch, for her bravery, at a time in which her people experienced great trauma, in a time where she did not have many choices. Even now she is an inspiration to others, just as when she lived. I'm honored to know her story and through her the experience of her people. Indigenous people have lived in the Utah area for many thousands of years, some archeological finds dating back as far as 12,000 years. Her people have their own unique and beautiful history that must be remembered. They are not my people, but I stand with them in honor of second up, their daughter, mother, and grandmother. I also wanna give special thanks to the Murdoch descendants who have reached out to me and aided in this research. They are white descendants from the other wives of Joseph Murdoch, and they hold Pernetta's memory as especially important. I would also like to thank Pernetta's direct descendants who have reached out to me and shared this, her history also. Even though Pernetta did not have many choices, the choices that she did make showed courage and kindness. Her people were directly affected by the doctrine of discovery and various beliefs about their spirituality and indigenous beliefs being unrighteous. Her people were directly affected, but especially children were affected. Children who are raised with beliefs that they are told are fact and watch their people 
basically convert or submit to colonization or die. But they survived. Did Pernetta's people need redemption? Or were they beautiful and whole just as they are? How do belief, beliefs impact actions towards indigenous people and indigenous beliefs and way of being? How do beliefs impact children? How do they impact children now? We can learn much from history and I have, and I am left hoping that we learn from Pernetta's history. Pernetta, named Sikkenep by her people. Toyaxit Noon, thank you.